once was a king named Sayus, who had as his queen Elsiade, daughter of Aeolus, master of the winds. These two adored each other and lived in a monotony of happiness. But nothing in this world is safe. It isn't true. It is. One day Alcide had heard that Sayix had ordered his ship to be made ready for a sea voyage to visit a far off oracle. How could you leave me alone? I'll pine in your absence. Over land is a long and arduous trip, but I'd still prefer that to a voyage by sea. Which I fear, for my father's winds are wild and savage. You think I should turn it on you naked some special treatment? Not so. Once those winds have escaped my father's cave, those winds are wild and beyond anyone's control. As a girl, I've watched them come home exhausted and spent, and I've learned to fear them then. Now I am petrified. Surely, she said, if you die, my life is over, and I shall be cursed with every reluctant breath I draw. My love, I hate to choose between my journey and you, but how can I live this way? Stranded on shore, afraid, domesticated, diminished, a kind of lapdog. Two months' time, I'll be back. No. I fear you fall down. Go! In two months' time, in that short time, you can be brave and endure the trial of waiting. She was hardly consoled, but she saw she could not hold out any longer in the face of his resolve. She allowed herself to be soothed and consented to his going. There were no more details left to be checked, no last-minute changes to make, and the men, arranged on their benches, were ready to row and go. He boarded and gave the sign, and then he turned to wave at her. She waved at him while the ribbon of black water widened between the ship and shore. She gazed at him until he was no longer distinguishable, but still, she could see the ship, and watch it as it receded to a smaller and smaller object. And then the whole hull was gone, and only the sails remained. And then they too disappeared. She gazed still at the empty and desolate blue, and then went to her empty bedroom to lie on the huge and vacant bed and give herself over to weeping. The vessel cleared the harbor and caught the freshening wind, which set the rigging to singing and slapping against the spars. I ordered the rowers to, to ship their oars and the sailors to set the yards and make sail. Our ship ran before the wind. We made satisfactory progress all that day and had reached the point of no return. With as much blue water astern as remained ahead. But as the sun was sinking in the west, the water everywhere blew until now began to be wet with the white capped waves the sailors disliked. The weather was worse at every moment, but the winds were on the loose. Rip the sail, secure the spar, fail the water. But the siren had arrived and the rest was one enormous greed and catastrophe. He thinks in an oddly abstracted way that the waves are lions, crazed with hunters' wounds, or that the ship is a town besieged by a horde of madmen. One would think the heavens were crazed with lust to join the turbulent sea. And returning this bizarre passion, the sea rises up to embrace the air. The men have lost their belief in their captain, their courage, their nautical skill, and even their will to live as they wait for the end. One weeps and groans aloud. Another, no braver, is silent, dumbstruck. Some call on the gods for mercy. Another curses his fate. And one says one word. Alcione! Again and again. Alcione, my treasure. Alcione. And this is the end of the world. Oh, gods, hear my modest prayer that my body may wash ashore at her feet, and with gentle hands she may prepare it to be buried.
nothing left but the slow parade led by Hermes to the underworld. Beyond where the Sumerians live in their gloomy caves is a deeper and even darker grotto, the home of sleep. In this place the sun never can, even at midday, penetrate with the faintest beams. In that cloudy twilight no rooster dares disturb the silence with his rude crowing. No dog or nervous goose gives voice to challenge the passing stranger, but an almost total silence fills the air. And at the heart of an almost painted stillness, the god himself relaxes drifting in languor. Fragments of ill-assorted dreams hover over the ground in grand profusion, and like leaves, the trees have to let go to flow through the currents of air and fall into their gorgeous billows below. Hello? Into this strange and breathless place, Iris the rainbow intrudes. Oh, stop only one. Stop only one. Wake up! Huh? Mildest of all the gods, soother of souls, and healer of wearied and pain wrecked bodies and minds. Iris, let me rest a moment. Iris, what do you want? Devise if you can. Some form to resemble King Saix and send it down in a dream to his wife, the Queen Alcyone. Let her know the news of the wreck of his ship and the death of the husband she loved so well. Sleep. Do this for us. Can you? Farewell. Morpheus. Morpheus! Come and change your shape to that of King Saix. Go to his wife and tell her. Tell her he is dead. That's good. That's really good. Now go.
For your prayers have done no good. For I am gone, beyond all hope or help, forever. Go away! I am not some bearer of tales, but the man himself to whom it happened. Look at me, my little bird. Calm upon the ocean. The days we call 